Hello, I am Suzanne Hilser Wells, president of GGNA, and I'm delighted to welcome you today to the latest in our thought leadership series. If you have questions during our conversation, please submit them via the Q&A button at the top or bottom of your screen. We won't have time to answer questions during today's session, but we welcome your questions and we'll answer them on our website in the days ahead. Today, I am joined by Nita, uh, <laughs> I got your name wrong already. <laughs> but I was so Genescus. worried about Nita's Genescus. last name. Yeah, <laughs> Nita Janaskis, which I know, uh, Associate Dean of Advancement at INSEAD, a top global school with campuses and programs in four countries and alumni throughout the world. I have had the opportunity to work with Nita over uh, several years now and have gotten to see her leadership in action. Um, before joining INSEAD over five years ago, Nita worked in fundraising at Harvard Business School and in industry. She and her team have built an extraordinarily successful campaign at INSEAD, not only breaking fundraising res uh, results, but also engaging a very wide group of people in the campaign effort. And Nita, we are so glad to have you here with us today. Ah, thanks um, for having me. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, first I'm gonna ask you to begin by telling our viewers a little bit about INSEAD, your current campaign and the advancement program to give them an overview of the, um, of the campaign and, and the context in which you're fundraising. Yeah, sure, happy to. Okay, so we'll, we'll, I'll break it down into three sections. So I think INSEAD, first of all, let me make sure you all know that INSEAD is the best business school in the world. I don't know if you saw the Financial Times ranking, but <laughs> hot off the press Monday, you know, number one. So very proud. We were also number one in, in 2016 and 2017. So we're always sort of, you know, hovering in the top three. So it's it's great. So we we feel really good about that. But I think we are also, you know, our tagline is we are the business school for the world. And that is really the truth. Um, we have a campus in France, in Fontainebleau, about a, an hour south of Paris, where I am right now. We have a campus in Singapore. We have a campus in Abu Dhabi. And as you mentioned, we just before COVID opened up uh, what we call the San Francisco hub, kind of an executive education alumni facility there. But you know, hasn't been open since since COVID, unfortunately. But um, we graduate a thousand MBAs every year, so we are the largest um, MBA program, really, amongst our peer schools. Um, you have to speak three languages to to come to INSEAD, sort of in terms of being an MBA student. Um, no nationality is over uh, represented more than 10%. So everybody really feels like they're in the minority, which I love. And I think staff represents that as well. I'm like a Lithuanian American living in Paris. It's very representative of what, what you see at INSEAD. Um, outside of the signature MBA program, we have EMBA, we have PhD. We just launched a MIM program. So for American audience, you may not know, but um, MIM is called Masters in Management. It's a one year after you do like your three year undergrad. It's very popular in Europe. So we just launched that. We see huge growth there. So we had our first class in September. So that's really exciting for us because uh, I don't think you launch degree programs that often, at least in CIA mm -hmm. doesn't. Yeah. And then we also have a big executive education arm, which we're also a top three provider in the world with Harvard Business School and Wharton. Before COVID, about 12,000 participants a year. So just like a really big program there. And then for our alumni, as you mentioned, there are 60,000 alumni in 175 countries. So really the, the depth and breadth of our alumni community is quite, um, quite exciting for us. And we just celebrated our 60th year at INSEAD. So it gives you a little bit of a context of where, where I'm working. And then let me just take a breath and <laughs> go into the campaign. Um, as you mentioned, so our campaign is called A Force for Good. So this is kind of our tagline. It's the mission statement now a bit of the school. 
Um, it sort of transcended past the campaign, which is quite exciting. The original campaign target was 200 million, but when we went public in 2018, we ended up bumping it to 250 million because we had received this really big transformational gift of 40 million. So we thought, well, we gotta go, we gotta go more. So we went to 250. Silent Face started in 2013. As I mentioned, we went public in 2018 and it's ending in 2023. So it's a 10 year campaign really centered in a way around the two terms of the Dean, which, which mm -hmm. works really well. Um, that we are already, you know, we've got two and a half years left. We have hit 271 million. So we're over our campaign mark. Um, but we, you know, our needs far outweigh that number. We decided we're not yeah. going to increase the target. We're just going to really talk about the, all the other areas that where we need support mm -hmm. because there are so many more needs. That's just how, kind of how much we thought we could raise over a 10 year period. Yeah. So it's exciting to see, um, that we've done more than that. Um, Absolutely. and then in terms of, um, you know, I think just not only the Euro target, but also a big part of the campaign has been participation. So another big one is like, how do we get our alumni to, to give consistently and more regularly? So we really track um, our 50% unique donor target number. So that's trying to say, we want our alumni to give at least one time during the campaign, one out of two of our alumni. So we're at about 43%, which sounds great, but that means that those are all people who have given in the last kind of seven and a half, eight years. Right. So we either have to acquire new donors or convert donors who haven't given yet to the campaign. Mm -hmm. And it's tough, right? So yeah, the participation yeah. though is critical for us. Yeah, and I will point out to, to our listeners that you should check out NCS terrific campaign website and um, they do track and it's very visible that number. So there clearly is a focus on community right up front. Yeah. And I think I just will add too. I think with the force for good, we did these three V's. So part of like a lot of communications and branding went into this mm -hmm. campaign. Mm -hmm. So we're, when we raise money, we, we raise them around like our values, which is like, you know, business and society and scholarships, our vision, which is everything around faculty, academic excellence, but also space transformation. And then our ventures, the third V, which is digital innovation, kind of our DNA, mm -hmm. but also areas like San Francisco that we're, we're, we're foraying into. So mm -hmm. I think that really helped frame the campaign as well, those three V's. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And how many people are on your team at NCF? Um, yeah, so we we have right now 60 people with an mm -hmm. advancement. Um, and obviously we have the kind of the traditional, um, you know, fundraising development team, alumni mm -hmm. relations events, operations, communications, et cetera. Um, they're on three. So about two thirds of the team is based in Fontainebleau. France, one third in Singapore. We have one person in Abu Dhabi. And up until very recently, we actually had somebody in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So really working on a 24 seven time clock, um, right. <laughs> which, which is quite, you know, interesting and, and but makes it actually very helpful. You lose some inefficiencies, just mm -hmm. not being all together, but also really able to, um, you know, work much more globally. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Thank you. So, um, so you've had terrific success in this campaign, as we mentioned, and we as your campaign council are often asked, so how, how'd they do it? Um, so would you share with people what has played out the way that you all thought it would and what hasn't? Um, well, I think some ways, you know, we invested quite heavily into the, as I kind of mentioned, the branding, the mm -hmm. collaterals, the events, the um, uh, the people that, and so we had this sort of wow effect and what we thought, well, once we do that, it will really cascade into the rest of the parts of, you know, yeah. advancement and then also yeah. INSEAD more broadly. So we really saw that. So we kind of went big there. And I think that mm -hmm. was huge ROI for us um, in terms of that ripple effect. So that that really worked. Um, so can I take, I, can I pause just for a second there and kind of point out to folks, yeah. you know, we do get, um, we get questions, especially in Europe and other parts outside of North America about will people give 
right, to a business school, to a university, outside of the kind of disaster relief we see. And, you know, one of NCAD's decisions was to do a lot of branding around this to bring visibility to philanthropy, the role of philanthropy and how it played into the vision. And I, I think that, you know, that was a really interesting choice. And given your culture, your history, a really, you know, sounds like a terrific investment. Yeah, I, absolutely. Um, also, I think more in the operations too, that came a little bit later afterwards, because mm -hmm. I think we were catching up. I think that happens where you invest in your fundraising team, you're investing in the, the comms and the events. And now we're like, oh my gosh, well, we need the back office to mm -hmm. support all of this because we had increased number of gifts to process our donor relations team that are really investing there. We have 13 foundations that we work with. I mean, mm -hmm. super complicated in terms of just like segmenting appeals or just processing those gifts. Not all the foundations, if you give, can go to every single one of the gift opportunities that we have. So um, that that I think has been really important and we're still kind of catching up to that. We're late to the game on the, I would say on the operation side, but we're getting mm -hmm. there. Um, you know, even interestingly, more recently, um, you know, we created what was called like a build the machine task force within advancement, mm -hmm. which is looking at like, what is our digital transformation? Because mm -hmm. we've been left behind a, a little bit at INSEAD in the school where, you know, the, the, and executive education had a bit more shine, you know, on them. Mm -hmm. And now with the campaign, we were able to say, hey, guys, we need this too. So we're now working into uh, working on digital marketing. We're bringing mm -hmm. on what's called Eloqua to do lead, you know, which is, is traditionally used for lead management to bring participants or, or students to the program. We're using, going to be using this for our, our fundraising. So I'm really excited to see all the yeah. digital areas and innovating in that way. And we still, still do the traditional mailings and everything, mm -hmm. but I, we're really hoping to, to do much more interesting segmentation in the future and personalization yeah. in that That's way. Great. So, so the campaign kind of allows you, I think, to do a step change in a lot of your mm -hmm. um, operation processes and people. Um, mm -hmm. So that I think was, was, was very helpful. Um, I think some of my surprises was that we hit the target so early uh -huh. I mean, we weren't expecting to so kind yeah. of managing leadership and the board well you should you know raise the raise the target again you know we right. hear that over right. and over again and we're like okay no we're not raising it any anything else we're going to stop talking about the target and really right. talking about the need where we, where we haven't you know raised enough um i think you know if people often think that there's a huge myth that Europeans don't give as you were as you were yeah. talking about you know our 75% of our euros that have been raised have been from Europe 60% mm -hmm. of all gifts came in from Europe now that matches we have about 60% alumni in Europe so it just goes to show that like there is so much potential in Europe and we're really hoping our sort of emerging markets for INSEAD is more Asia the Middle East and the Americas uh -huh. so it's it's, it's almost a different way of, of, of looking at it. I share that um, stati those statistics you just shared with lots of people to encourage them. <laughs> yeah, because there was an idea in the beginning that maybe more, a bigger percentage um, would come from North America, but you, you've you had extraordinary leadership and volunteer leadership from people in Europe who've been super generous as well. Yeah, I think that's been a real interesting journey. And I haven't really seen this, um, you know, maybe at other peer schools, they have had the same experience, but we invested quite a bit in a, what we have, we have these 60 national alumni associations. Mm -hmm. So very strong volunteer committees um, in these different countries. And they're really independent. They're, they're sort of work in tandem mm -hmm. and partnership with alumni relations, but they kind of have their own governance. They have their own spirits. Um, but they're very closely connected. And so we took a lot of time at like alumni volunteer meetings to talk to them about why the campaign is so important, why culture of philanthropy needs to change at INSEAD. And it was actually them who a few years ago said, listen, we should create a giving day. Mm -hmm. And so we have now had this explosion of, you know, the last few years of giving day going, I think the first year we raised about 300,000. Last year, we raised over 2 million. That's over just a few years. Yeah. And it's been a 
co-sponsored by both these sort of national alumni associations, but also the fundraising volunteers. And so that kind of partnership, you know, I have not seen before. And, and it just it really goes towards the spirit of the INSEAD alumni mm -hmm. of really wanting to help when you're asked. And they just needed yeah. to, they needed to understand better what, yeah. what we needed from them. Well, and I and and your campaign, you have both an incredibly um, committed campaign cabinet and the, and leadership all the way through these alumni associations, as you said. So um, I'm going I'm going to point to you, Nitto, when we're when we're told by clients, yes, we understand volunteers that are effective, but gosh, they're a lot of work. And I'm sure you would attest to, yes, they are a lot of work, but it really is effective in getting motivating big gifts and then also a lot of gifts so that's absolutely cool. i mean again i the one thing i would say for our you know um campaign cabinet mm -hmm. is is that it's a it's ours is a bit big like we have 38 mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. I, in hindsight i wish we had done it we didn't have so many because trying to really actively manage so you have yeah. those who are like super into it and yeah. are so dedicated and our chair is amazing. And then we just lose a little bit of people and it becomes a bit a name only. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. that is one thing I, I, you know, sort of a lesson learned that maybe uh -huh. would have made it a bit smaller for yeah. us. Yeah, but yeah. I think, no, I, I think that we see that. In fact, actually just yesterday I was talking to a, a client about that. They were talking about a 30 person campaign committee. And if you're really talking about activating people, you can invite people to do one or two tasks that will have a great impact. Um, managing a committee of 30 can become its own job. So <laughs> I appreciate that as a lesson yeah. learned. <laughs> Um, so with three campuses and a facility in San Francisco, you've always had to manage a team remotely and build engagement strategies for a geographically diverse alumni population. What are the lessons that your team has learned that you think others should be thinking about applying, particularly as we come out of the pandemic? Yeah, well, I think first of all, what's what's what what is really important and what I focused on a lot this last year is making sure your team is is healthy first, you know, mm -hmm. in a way, because I find too that sometimes we give quite a bit to our alumni. So mm -hmm. we were already, you know, I was already managing because we had I have a team Abu Dhabi, Singapore, San Francisco. We're already used to Zoom. We were already on MS Teams, right? We are already working in that way. So that was not a hard adjustment. But we were also traveling, you know, having those events, like, mm -hmm. you know, we're big into champagne at Inseat, I have to say. So like having that glass of champagne. One of my favorite things about you. <laughs> <laughs> It's like having that and just like appreciating each other and and being together really really lost that so you know even little things like i created office hours so every week teams mm -hmm. can you know sign up for 20 minute slots i have six every week anybody can join and say hey what's up and we can talk about things because i'm seeing less people right because i'm not right. traveling and not running around also, like even on MS Teams, we did we have like a recognition wall as one of our channels and we have like question of the week, which is not work related. So I think that engagement is very important and that gives people more energy to be able to kind of give that energy to others. So I think also, you know, just bringing it back to our alumni, because we already have the 60,000 alumni base in 175 countries, we had already been thinking about, man, how are we going to connect with people outside of like when they come back for their reunions every five mm -hmm. years? You know, this is this was already an issue for us. Yeah. And so we had a couple of years ago hired actually an alumna who became our director of lifelong learning and started putting together a strategy with connecting our alumni alumni closer to the school remotely. And so that that also helped having that person who is already thinking about it, but to put it in perspective, before COVID in that academic year, we were planning for six webinars, you know, for mm -hmm. the year. <laughs> and then COVID hit and we did over 50, maybe even, I think we did 60 webinars in a six wow. month period and engaged over 50,000 people, mm -hmm. alumni and participants, but man, we went like, went so quick. So now we're kind of, as we're kind of not working, not that we're coming out of the pandemic, but we're in a different stage. We're now getting a better cadence. We're doing like two webinars 
a, a, a month, right? Uh-huh. So we're starting to see like what really works for our teams, right. you know, so that right. we're not burning people out, but also bringing in the engaging content so that people uh-huh. join. And, you know, we will have upwards of a thousand people join for these webinars, which is, which is terrific. I think we also launched iLink, which is Uh a peer-to-peer career advising and networking platform recently. So this is really to get our alumni to talk to each other more through this platform. And soon we'll be bringing the students on so that they can mentor the students. Uh So I'm pretty excited about that connection, you know, with one another and then back with the students because they they absolutely love that. Um, and then the last thing maybe I'll mention is, you know, I, you know, all of our events obviously went digitally. Yeah. So we did, um, you know, our reunions, we went digital and we still got about 36, 40% participation across wow. the classes, which was pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we have a global INSEAD day every year, every September, it marks like the year that INSEAD had its, or the month that, that, that INSEAD started, it's kind of an mm-hmm. anniversary thing. Mm-hmm. And um, usually they're events hosted by the National Alumni Associations um, locally. And this time we decided to do a 24 hour uh, webinar stream and each of the national alumni associations of countries took you know, a time slot and we had faculty and you could join whenever you wanted during this 24 hour period. Very, I think, innovative. And there we were, I think we had over 7,000 alumni who joined in at some wow. point. So that's, that's I feel like really we're, we're, we're engaging with people actually much more so mm-hmm. than before, I mean, differently. Mm-hmm. So I'm just hoping for the future Mm-hmm. We definitely want events to come back. We are dying mm-hmm. to have those in person. I yeah. think the rubber band will snap back, but I think there's also going to be a blended experience. Um, and, and we're in in the the digital piece is not going to go. It's not going to go away. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, we're seeing that with clients, they're engaging people who have never participated before, either because their you know travel schedule for their own job is so busy. Or, you know, they don't live near a place where we regularly have events. So um, I think the chance to broaden and engage a much wider community is exciting and definitely one that we hope will continue, um, you know, as we come out of this, this pandemic. So that's, that's terrific. You know, go ahead. We're, we're just going to say, I just want to add one thing. I was thinking one of the other things that um, I just want to mention because it's, you know, it's that blended approach, even for donor relations, we're still, I know some schools, for example, have gone into a full on donors report online, right? Mm -hmm. So this year we're still sending the donors report to people, Uh but the, 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 the honor roll is online. So we're, Uh it's, it's like, we still think it's important for people to get something in the mail for us, from us, Mm -hmm. like, especially because we produce such a beautiful report, but some of it is going digitally. Or when we opened up the San Francisco hub, we have like the digital brick wall because the brick wall is a big thing in Fontainebleau and Uh you know, it's part of the nostalgia Uh and it brings, I think people back, but then also combining it with the digital piece. So I think there's some really interesting things coming out um, through the pandemic. um, That's great. Innovation. Yeah, some chance to try some new things. That's that's terrific. Um, so you were promoted from within your own department. So as you were taking on this new role, what is some of the best advice you got? Yeah, so maybe yeah, I'll just take just a quick second to give people yeah, like a, a, a little my background because it might be interesting. So I graduated with a finance degree. I went, became a financial analyst. I was an asset manager. Then I started working for Harvard Business School in the fundraising department. Um, so did that for five years. Then back in 2008, my husband was transferred to Paris for work. So I became a trailing spouse uh-huh. and we came over with my two little kids and I actually was at home with them and had a third child here for four years. So stay at home mom. Then Harvard Business School rehired me to run the fundraising in Europe and, and then INSEAD found me. Okay, and I became the, the head of development for the executive director of development. And that's when I met you, Suzanne. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, I joined INSEAD and a year later, um, 
my boss, Joanne Shoveler at the time, she, uh, she decided that she was going to make her move and go back to Canada, go back home. And so it was really, I was there for less than a year. And all of a sudden there was this opportunity to, to, to potentially go for the associate dean role. But, you know, I had mm-hmm. never managed a department. This uh-huh. was like a big, a big step for me, right? I remember. And, you know, <laughs> she, yeah. And she was like, you know what? Make them find someone better than you. Like, get in there. Why are you not throwing in your, you know, just, just go for it. And I thought that yeah. was, yeah, I kind of needed that push mm-hmm. from her, I think, to, to go for it. And then right around that time, and once I, you know, I did get the position in the end, um, I was on, so going back to your, your, uh, what was the best advice that you've ever yeah. received? There was, I was at that time we were celebrating 50 years of women at INSEAD in the MBA program, because in the beginning at INSEAD for the first 10 years, actually, there were no women in that program. Mm-hmm. So, and it was like a momentous occasion. And so, um, I went on to the show, I was invited because I was running this kind of what was called IW50, big initiative yeah. at INSEAD. And I was invited on, on the show called The 51%, which is, um, if those of you maybe who know France 24, or France 24, it's like the CNN of France. And um, this woman said, you know, I want you to come on and talk about what's happening at INSEAD. And I remember like, you know, preparing for this, you know, I'm going to be on TV. Like I've never been on TV. I've never been more scared in my entire life. And she comes out and this, the, the, the anchor, you know, Annette comes out and she's like, are you okay? And I said, I don't know if I can do this. You know, she took me by the shoulder and she said, you belong here, you know, don't let yourself get in the way. And mm-hmm. I think there was like, she's like, get out of your head, you know? And it was like yeah. exactly what I needed to hear at that time. And so I think that for me, that was something I kind of always remind myself, don't, you know, you belong here. You got this. Like, mm-hmm. even if there's moments of fake it to your make it, everybody does that, right? Yeah. Own it. So. I love, I love that. And, you know, I, um, I appreciate you telling that story about Joanne too, because, um, and Nita and I have spent a lot of time, uh, you know, in our off hours talking about women in leadership and managing family and careers. And, you know, there are so many studies that show that women who really are quite qualified don't feel qualified. So don't even apply for jobs. So the fact that Joanne, you know, said to you, let them find somebody better, somebody more qualified was terrific. Um, you know, just as you said, the push you need. So I, I, lo- I love that. And that, you know, you belong here. I think as we think about our team members, too often as we, um, you know, I hear from hiring managers across clients, you know, we want to, the fit isn't right. Well, you know, if we, if we look just for fit, we tend to be talking about people who look like us and think like us and have the same experience. If we talk about belonging, that's actually embracing people with a wide set of skills and experience that together are going to make our team stronger. So I love that. Um, And I will absolutely be quoting you on both of those. Um, So Nita, thank you so much for, for being with us today. I so appreciate it. It's really fun to catch up. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank Nita, our team at GGNA who produces these um, webinars, and all of you for listening in. I'm going to invite any of you listening to connect with me, with the firm, with Nita via LinkedIn. And if you would, uh, if you'd like to um, reach out to GGNA to talk about any of the issues we've discussed here today. Please send us comments or questions via our website or LinkedIn. Nita, it's been such a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And it's always such a pleasure to work with you and GGNA, Suzanne. So thank you. All right, everyone have a terrific day. Bye-bye.